Hello and welcome. I'm Lynn Fries, producer of Global Political Economy, or GPE News Talks. Today's guest is William Mitchell. He'll be talking about a progressive vision of society for a post-neoliberal world. William Mitchell is a professor of economics and director of the Center of Full Employment and Equity at the University of Newcastle in Australia. Some of his recent books include Eurozone, Dystopia, and Reclaiming the State. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. Thanks for having me. We're going to be discussing a progressive vision of society as opposed to that of the neoliberal world. The obvious place to start seems to be with the role of workers. So what would a progressive concept of productive labor look like in the private and public sector, uh, respectively? If you go back to the sort of 1930s, when a lot of these ideas started to be developed, there was a concept called the gainful worker. And a gainful worker was defined as someone who really contributed to the creation of private profit through their labour. So already it was a biased or a loaded concept that was explicitly associated with capitalist surplus value production and realisation of profit. And so if you think about that, then it excluded a whole lot of other things that uh, people could do with their, with their labour uh, power uh, that didn't contribute to private profit. And that really became the, the dominant concept of productive work, that uh, uh, if you weren't doing that, then you were unproductive. And so a whole lot of biased concepts and, and opinions about, for example, public sector employment that uh, aims to provide services to the, the community, uh, you know, that was considered to be somewhat suspect. And going one step further, if the government sought to use its uh, fiscal capacity to introduce job creation programs when in times of high unemployment, then that was uh, that sort of work was of the sort of work that we saw during the Great Depression and subsequent downturns. That work was dismissed as make work or boondoggling or leaf raking, you know, a number of pejorative descriptors that were designed to uh, bias the opinion of the listener or the reader to, well, that work's useless and it's not productive. And that's really biased the way we've thought about uh, what, what prospects we have for solving mass unemployment and the options that governments have because Governments then, in, particularly in this, this neoliberal era, have become incredibly fearful of being dismissed as supporting make-work schemes. And uh, uh, it's really turned our attention away from really useful policy implications. Now, if you then, then take that orthodoxy and think about, well, what's wrong with it? Well, what's wrong with it is it evaluates worth in terms of private costs and benefits. So what's good for the bottom line of a corporation is equated with what's good for society. Now, there's a whole body of literature that tells us that that can't possibly be true, that there are so many things that uh, can be done in a societal sense that don't have anything really do, to do with advancing the well-being or, or you know, the profits potential of corporations that add value to, to our lives and our society, which, uh, which can be undertaken. And so in my view, we have to broaden our concept of worth into social benefits and social costs and uh, consider things not in terms of private terms, but in terms of social terms. Now, there's a whole range of activities then that immediately become productive and worthwhile that will never be done as an outcome of the calculus of whether it's profitable for private companies or not, but are incredibly beneficial to society. And once you start thinking like that, a very broad concept, 
then the options that open up to policymakers and and our response to those options in a political sense become quite different to the way we think now. Explain how we got to this way of thinking. How, as you say, our, our way of thinking about work has changed from thinking of work as something that's beneficial to society to thinking work's only valuable if it contributes to profits in the private sector and that public sector work is worthless, a boondoggle. Well, I think, you know, I think in the immediate post-Second World War period, we the, the, the role of the state was really... Uh, different to what it is now. The state, in my view, in broadly the 30 years after the end of the Second World War, was a mediator in the conflict between labour and capital. And so it stood between those two conflicting classes and sought to appease that conflict in various ways, but with a definite bias toward lifting the material prosperity of labour through a number of ways, but, you know, broadly through ensuring there was true full employment, that everybody who wanted a job could find a job, uh, uh, ensuring that uh, there was a safety net for those who, who for some short period, couldn't find work. So, uh, And that was then broadened into concepts of welfare states that ensured that people who couldn't work were able to be supported uh, uh, in sickness, in incapacity of some sort or another through age, and and the expansion of public education, public transport, public health systems, and all the things that we identify with that period of uh, material prosperity, falling inequality, and you know pretty strong economic growth uh, and very high levels of, of employment. And you know major reductions in poverty after after the destruction of the Second World War. Now, you know that didn't appease that didn't satisfy the interests of capital, but they were really stuck because uh, that social democratic era was a very powerfully powerful political uh, force, uh, and uh, that we were as voters and citizens we were pretty engaged in ensuring that our governments if would would honor the agreements that, you know the visions that they had outlined in 1945 46 47 now towards the end of the 1960s uh, there was a major um, counter attack from capital it was organized uh, uh, you know in in the united states there was a so-called power manifesto that was released and uh, that manifesto outlined a, a multi-pronged way in which capital could fund initiatives to restore the political balance in their favour. And so you saw the rise of think tanks and the infiltration of the media and the creation of, uh, you know, what we now see as Fox News in America and, you know, the, the derivatives elsewhere, the infiltration into the education programs and and a range of other strategies that were very well funded and very well executed. And the state didn't go away. It didn't wither away with globalisation. It just became reconfigured in, in the, to serve the interests of capital. The accomplishments or the changes that we deem to be characteristic of neoliberalism were really accomplished through the legislative power of the state. And the state has really become an agent of capital, working to benefit that class and using the working class as as, as fodder. And uh, progressively, what that strategy has done has you know created the so-called gig economy, has uh, retrenched a lot of uh, welfare provisions that the state provided, privatised a lot of the utilities and turned them into profit-making bonanzas for, for capital. Uh, a range of other things that have accompanied that, that retrenchment of, of uh, the social democratic era. And, and that's where we are now. And, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're in a, a parlous state because of it. 
So with the retrenchment of the social democratic era, you're saying the state did not go away. But in keeping with a planned strategy from the late 1960s, capital reconfigured the state to serve its interests. From the gig economy to the privatization of public utilities, you've given us a diverse uh, set of examples of the outcome. And your argument being a progressive framework would place society rather than private profit at the center of decision making. And that to advance this kind of visions, progressives uh, need to reestablish a core focus on uh, the main contradictions of the neoliberal paradigm. So expand on that and also give us a sense of whether or how such contradictions and so conflicts can be resolved within the capitalist system. Start with some history on how this paradigm became mainstream in the first place. And so what you see is deep roots to the current challenge facing progressives. I think the progressive side of uh, the debate really sold out in the 1970s. And, uh, you know, they, they bought the line that the treasures of global capital and the globalisation of supply chains, etc., had rendered the state ineffective and that the role of the state had to be, had to modify so that it initially appeased the foreign exchange markets uh, or else those markets would retaliate and cause currency havoc within the countries. And so at that point, the progressive side of the debate really abandoned the macroeconomic terrain as a contestable terrain and started to focus research and activism on all sorts of things like identity, uh, you know, and uh, methodology and, and a whole range of important but distractions from the main game. And, you know, we, we, we evolved into progressive writers even saying that, you know, the old framework where class conflict was the organising framework for discussion was irrelevant now. And so you had progressive writers sort of talking about, to use an example, you know, saying that working class women had more in common with their, with their female bosses than they did have with their fellow male workers. And the abandonment of economic class as an organising framework was, has been very pronounced. The issues about identity, race and sexuality and gender, and things, they're not unimportant areas of inquiry. But I, I don't consider that they should subjugate the starting point as, of being economic class in a capitalist system. And so what we've had is, a, you know, a few decades of progressive discussions that are really, really conducted within the framework set at the macro level by, by the neoliberals, by the mainstream, by the orthodoxy. And that becomes a straitjacket. I've written today about a former British Labor Prime Minister thinking that the governments haven't got enough money to deal with climate change and that we then have to tax petroleum companies to get the money. Well, that's just absurd. You might want to tax the petroleum companies for another reason, but you know the advanced countries have all the currency power that they need to address climate issues. And so we've, we've had this period where we've been in this straitjacket, the progressive side of the debate, and uh, tinkering around the edges and... Uh, talking about how we've got to facilitate financial markets to fund the climate challenge and all of these distractions that, are, uh, that, that have led us further and further into the abyss. And, um, and, and progressively I'm thinking now that the real issue, and I've probably always thought this, but I'm now articulating that as a senior sort of citizen in the academy, is that the, the real problem, you know, human civilizations have collapsed historically. And I think that uh, we're now at the end, the end game of neoliberalism and probably the end game, and neoliberalism is probably 
the ad most advanced form that capitalism as a system of production and ex distribution can go. And I think that the conflicts and the inherent contradictions of neoliberalism and hence capitalism are, are reaching a end point where, 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 where we, we, we're about to make some sort of change. Now, what I mean by that is that I don't believe in an existential way that human society in its current form can survive where the primary decision-making calculus is based upon the pursuit of private profit, the privileging of private profit above all of else. Uh, I don't believe that can be is a sustainable method of uh, running our world. And the primary decision-making calculus referred to is, of course, part and parcel of the macroeconomic framework, and so policy options set under neoliberalism. You already cited some instances where the framing of debate being articulated by the traditional political left, and even progressives, has acquiesced to that framework. So talk more about the path taken by the traditional political left. Well, in you know, in my last major research effort, which came out in a book called Reclaiming the State, Pluto Press, 2017, and I wrote that with a co-author, my task there was to try to understand when the turning points occurred in history. When did the Social Democrats become neoliberal? What, what were the precipitating events in world history where these changes occurred? And you can trace them back. I mean... A lot of people think, for example, that Margaret Thatcher led the first monetarist government. Well, no, she didn't. The British Labor government with James Callaghan as Prime Minister was the first monetarist government. And, uh, you know, in the early 70s, the ideas of Milton Friedman and the monetarists started to take over the academy. And then they started to permeate out into central banking and uh, treasury departments and those ideas really, st you know, the British Labor Party were the first to embrace them wholly uh, under James Callaghan and uh, Dennis Healy as his Chancellor. And you had that famous speech at the 1976 annual Labor conference in Blackpool where Callaghan said that the, the idea that governments can create jobs by spending is over. The, we, the governments now have to manage inflation and uh, have to appease foreign exchange markets. And that was the beginning. So in the late 1970s in France, the so-called conservative government uh, uh, with uh, Raymond Barr as the, the uh, Minister for Finance and, and Economics you know, they, were, they became monetarists and invoked very hard inflation-first policies which caused, didn't bring down inflation but caused increased poverty and unemployment and uh, misery for the French people. Now, Francois Mitterrand was a socialist and was elected to reverse all of that. He, he came to power in in that time on a on a you know fundamental socialist agenda with Jacques Delors his, as his minister for finance and and but by 1983 they had succumbed to neoliberalism and you had the famous turn to austerity in 1983 where the the finance ministry overruled the planning ministry which was still Keynesian and uh, you had the so-called Frankfurt policy, the strong Frank policy. And uh, Jacques Delors basically told the French people as Minister for Finance that unless they behave like Germans, then France was going to become uh, uh, an impoverished state. And, you know, the turn to austerity was the adoption of neoliberalism by a socialist government. And... Uh, you know, Jacques Delors then went on to become a uh, European Commission boss and he led the way to create the Economic and Monetary Union, the Eurozone, uh, 
with his work in the late 1980s, which has become the exemplar of neoliberalism embedded in the, in the legal framework even of the European Union. And this was all driven by, by so-called left-wingers, progressive socialists, whatever you want to call them, social de- democrats. Progressive forces have become sidetracked in, as I said earlier, not unimportant issues, but, but sidetracked issues. And the main game, the macroeconomics, have, has just become an uncontested space where the progressive political forces will say, oh, we'll, we'll, we'll get the budget back into surplus slightly more slowly than the rest of them and we'll do it slightly more fairly than the Conservatives, but we'll still do it. And not realising that doing it, whether quickly or slowly, is unviable and destructive. Give us a picture of a progressive vision of constructive and viable ways the state can act, and more specifically, the role of public sector enterprises. First of all, we've got to recognise that all the stories that my profession, the economics profession, tells us about the capacities of our governments uh, are just fictions. Uh, And and one of the reasons why we have allowed uh, the the sort of principles of social democracy to to go by the wayside is because we have all of these beliefs in the government going to go broke or if it spends too much... uh, the it'll, it'll tax us into extinction and all of these fictions that are just narrowing down our perception of what our governments can do on our behalf. So that's my principal role as an academic to to educate people about those fictions and to provide them with a much more realistic appraisal of what our governments can do and what the limitations on our governments are. They're, they're not financial limitations, they're resource limitations. And Once you start thinking like that, the scope for, say, fiscal policy, spending and taxation, broadens massively, and the options that we would start seeing uh, are quite quite diverse and, and, you know, really adventurous uh, if we really could embrace that sort of truth. Uh, That's that's the first step. But, you know, once we have that perception, we've got to start uh, thinking of the state as as an enabler rather than just a you know a, a, an agent of capital and you know that's that's going to require for example you know renationalisation of most of our large utilities and uh, 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 huge infra- public infrastructure investment and a revitalisation of our public health systems and uh, much tighter regulation of private corporations. And, you know, from my perspective, a fundamental uh, outlawing of, of almost uh, all of the what goes on in financial markets. Now, you know, OK, people will say pie in the sky, and I agree. And that's why I, I, I'm leaning more these days to fundamental system change rather than being able to do that type of required adjustments within the scope of the capitalist ownership system. A comment now more about government policies to support full employment. Well, if you if you go back to the true full employment period after the Second World War, there was strong private sector employment growth in the reconstruction phase and then subsequently as, as uh, societies became richer and uh, mass consumption became a norm. And uh, there was strong public sector employment growth as we expanded the welfare state and management of public infrastructure and public services. But th- those two sources of employment were still not sufficient to ensure that everybody had a job. And what the third component was that the state stood ready to always provide jobs for anybody who wanted them and and they were inclusive to even the, the, the worker who had the most disadvantage. And so you had a whole range of jobs in 
public infrastructure agencies like roads, railways, uh, local government in, you know, gardens, parks, a whole range of jobs all through the public sector that were were relatively low paid, they were, they were minimum wage or around that. Uh, they were always available. Uh, they, they, they didn't discriminate on colour, on gender, whether you were mentally ill or not, uh, whether you'd just come out of prison or not, uh, uh, whether you were, you know, just wanting a short-term job or, or, or not. They, they always were there to soak up the people who, for whatever reason, couldn't find a job in the, let's call it the regular economy, whether it be private or public sector. Now, it's the only reason we had that strong employment during that period. And, of course, that was uh, one of the casualties of the neoliberal attack on governments. And that's, you know, one of the reasons that attack occurred was because the corporate sector wanted a, a pool of unemployed that they could exploit to suppress wages growth. And, you know, this was this beginning of the era of redistribution away from wages towards profits. You know, in Australia, for example, in the 1970s, the share of wages in national in GDP was around 60%. It's now below 50%. And that's that redistribution has gone to profits. And so, you know, that occurred as an attack on trade unions, on pernicious industrial relations legislation, but also the creation of a permanent pool of underemployed and unemployed. Now... My, my belief is that a society that aims to be sophisticated, inclusive, uh, has to provide a safety net of jobs so that anybody can walk up and have a job on any day that, it, that a person needs a job. And we, can, we have the financial capacity and the unmet community need to make those jobs meaningful, to pay them at a socially acceptable, inclusive minimum wage. Now, what I mean by that is not a poverty wage. It's a wage that allows a person to be included in society, to go to sporting events when they want to at the weekend, to have a holiday, to go to the opera if that's their inclination, to provide risk manage for their families and have adequate housing and nutritional standards. Now, Every, every nation has the capacity to do that and that would provide a, a, a sort of minimum level of security and sophistication for society and satisfy the, the human need to feel included and productive. And our concept of, you know, going back to our, our beginning point today, uh, we can broaden productivity to to be very inclusive. So, you know, the extreme example I use to make the point is that a major problem in Australia in summer are people people drowning in our oceans because they they go in and they're unprepared. Now, who knows the oceans the best? Well, the surfers who love to ride the waves off our east coast beaches. Now, I would then offer the surfers a guaranteed job and say, OK, what are you going to do for you, your living now at this, uh, this guaranteed public sector job? Well, you can surf. Go for it. What else are you going to do as a responsible reciprocation for that? Well, you can provide lessons for school children uh, on the beaches about water safety, teach them to to learn to interpret uh, rips in the ocean and when to go in and where to go in and when not to do that. Now, would that be productive? Massively productive. It saves lives. It increases community enjoyment. Uh, it provides much more sustainability for our summer beaches and our recreation and, and, and our enjoyment. Now, under conventional productivity measures, that would be considered unproductive activity. But under my broad concept of uh, productivity, that's a massive societal gain. Everybody 
becomes happier, safer, and has more enjoyment and more sustainable communities. And that's an, an extreme example to, to push the debate out to, to the edge as to what I mean by broadening out our concepts of effective use of our resources. Uh, the mainstream orthodoxy considers all of those resources should be in the service of private profit, whereas I see that our resources should be in the service of society and and the well-being of our planet. You know, in Australia at the moment, there's 10% of the available and willing workforce who are either unemployed or underemployed. Now, that's a massive waste of resources, and those people want to work. You know, often progressives say, oh, well, we should have just guaranteed incomes because people don't want to work. Well, the reality is that when you do surveys of the unemployed and the underemployed, they all want to work and progressives should be pushing governments to do everything they can to reduce underemployment and unemployment. There's no doubt about it. The government can buy whatever is available for sale in its own currency, including all light or labour. So once you understand that, then you immediately understand that if there's mass unemployment, as there is now, then that's a political choice, not an inevitability. And progressives seem to, you know, a, a lot of the basic income uh, gang uh, start with the presumption that the government can't do anything about unemployment, so let's find a solution given that there's going to be mass unemployment. Well, my solution goes one step before that and say it's a political choice. For those that can work, I think we've got a, a moral obligation and a societal obligation to do what we can to improve the well-being of our society in material terms without destroying our natural environment. We've got to pressure politically our governments to provide jobs for all. And then, you know, for those who can't work, provide adequate income and safety net security, that's for sure. Expand on this issue you raise, that a job guarantee is better than a basic income. I'm thinking here specifically of your argument that a job guarantee provides what you call a strong evolutionary dynamic in terms of establishing a, a broader transition away from the unemployment and insecurity intrinsic to the capitalist mode of production, whereas the basic income does not. Explain that. That's right. I mean, you know, if you, if you distill the basic income down to what it is, is it's a consumption subsidy. It's saying, it's saying to society, listen, we're not, we're not prepared to give you a job we're not prepared to allow you to contribute to, to, to society through your labour and production. But what we want is, you to be, is not to starve and we want you to be able to buy goods and services so that capitalists can make profits. So really it's reducing humanity down to consumption units and not realising that work is much more than earning an income. Work is... Uh, is a way in which we identify with each other in, in, in the community, which we get self-esteem and, uh, you know, a feeling of worth that we're contributing to the broader social goals and we're part of a community of, of workers. Uh, the basic income crowd have sort of completely forget about all of that and they just want us to be consumption units. Now, the evolutionary part of the job guarantee that you referred to, I think, is, is the key because uh, I don't think we're ready yet as, a, as societies to have people not working. Both individually, we're not ready to do that ourselves because our sense of worth is embedded in our work but also our sense of looking at our next door neighbour. We, we don't want them to be not contributing while we're contributing. That's the state, in my view, of society at the moment. Also, we need time to embrace the surfer example I gave you. Uh, and so by introducing public sector work, that really pushes the envelope out on what we consider to be productive work and what we consider to be of value to society, we can slowly but surely appreciate a much wider scope of human activity 
that takes us further and further away from a relationship to capitalism as worthwhile and not being related to capital as being worth less. And so we eventually get to an evolutionary stage where we understand that a whole range of activities that have got nothing to do with private profit are of extreme value to us and are to be promoted. And I think that if we can engender that sort of evolution, we have the best chance of minimising a chaotic end to all of this. Those things, getting back to the beginning again, are incredibly productive. And because if you... In terms of a measurement system that value that measures productivity by social worth and social value rather than private profit and private value, and I think that should be the progressive agenda. It's not, but it should be, and it's certainly my agenda. We're going to have to leave it there for today, William Mitchell. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Thank you for having me. And thank you for joining us.